In this section, we're going to revisit the idea of using tangent lines to find the limit of secant lines. Um, we'll use that to define the derivative at the point, which is just going to be that slope of the tangent line. Um, and then we'll see some applications of derivatives, such as marginal cost and velocity. So let's go ahead and get into this section. So if you remember from section 2.1, we saw how to find the slope of secant lines and use this to estimate the slope of the tangent line. So let's go ahead and remember that definition. So the slope of a secant line, we had our nice line here. So we had our function. To find the secant line, we found two different points on that graph of that function. So we can find a point here and a point here. And then we just drew the straight line between those two points. And that was our secant line. So if this first point was the point A, F of A, and the second point was the point B, F of B, then the slope of that line was just going to be that F of B minus F of A, the change in Y, over the change in X, B minus A. So then we said what we wanted to do is in order to make this a slope of a tangent line instead of a secant line, we're going to take this point here, this B point, and we're going to move it closer and closer to that A point. And so those tangent lines are going to get closer and closer to our secant lines. So that tangent line, we wanted, if we call this point now some x, comma f of x, we wanted to do f of x minus f of a over x minus a, but we wanted x to get close to a. So now that we've gotten to see limits, we can actually use limits to define that better or to more, more exactly. So I'm just going to say that this is the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus x, x of f of a over x minus a. So that's the slope of that tangent line that we can define using limits. Now, there's different ways that we can write this. So it's sometimes helpful to use an alternate definition here. So instead of calling this point x f of x, we're going to notice that the point x is a small distance from the point A. And now it actually can be in front of A or it could actually be behind A as well. That's fine. It's just a small distance from that point A. So we're going to let that x just be some A plus some small number, h. So instead of writing x, I'm just going to write A plus h. And I'm going to do this in the same definition. So my f of x becomes an f of a plus h. And so I have f of a plus h minus f of a. And now on the bottom, I had x minus a. So x is equal to a plus h. And then I'm subtracting away that a. So I'm just going to get the a is canceling. So I have that h on the bottom. And now <clears throat> I'm going to still have this limit. And as x goes towards a, that quantity x minus a, that quantity, they're approaching each other. So that's going to go to 0. So we can say that the h quantity goes to 0. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. Either of those are going to give us that slope of the tangent line at the point x equals a. So either of these give us that slope of the tangent line to the function f of x, oops, f of x at x equals a. So that's important to remember. And often we can choose which of these two definitions that we want to use. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and we need to make sure we remember these definitions. So I'm just going to copy them and then we'll bring them to us to the next page so that we can use those. 
So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to copy this and bring it over to my next slide. Okay, so here, let's begin bringing those definitions that we have. So we're going to add that clip art definition that we just made. Pull that up here. And we remember that these both definitions both give us that slope of the tangent line. Okay, so this question that we have here asked us to find the equation of the tangent line to the graph of x squared at x equals 3. So let's go ahead and try that. So I'm looking for the equation of a line here. So since I have the equation of a line, I know I want to find a point on that line. And I want to find the slope of that line. So we can do each of those. If I think about what they're telling us here, it's the tangent line 2 f of x equals x squared. That's my nice parabola here. At x equals 3. So I'm going to go up. 3 on the function, I go up to 9, because 3 squared is 9, and I'm looking for this tangent line here. So the line that touches the function just at that one point. Because it touches at that one point, I know that that point, 3 comma 9, is a point on my line. So we can put that in as a point on the tangent line. In general, we're going to always have that nice point this point on the tangent line is just going to be whatever they give you that a and then f of a. So we're just going to plug the x value they give you into that function to get a point on the tangent line. Now the slope of the tangent line, that's what we just found these formulas for. So the slope of the tangent line is defined by the limit either as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a, or the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. So we can decide which of those we want to use. Um, let's go ahead and I'm just going to go decide to focus on this bottom definition here. Again, it doesn't matter if you want to focus on that top definition, you can, but just so we have one definition to use for each of our examples, I'm going to use that bottom definition. So I'll say that the slope of that tangent line at x equals 3 so that means the a in my definition is 3, because that's the slope at that point, is going to be the limit as h goes to 0 of f of the a becomes a 3 and the h stays an h minus f of 3 all over h. So now I can go ahead and plug in 3 plus h to my function and then plug in 3 to the function. So remember, we always have to make sure we rewrite our limit here. My f of x was equal to x squared. So if I put in 3 plus h for x, I just get 3 plus h squared. So that's my f of 3 plus h. Minus f of 3, so I'm just going to put 3 in for x. So that's just my f of 3. Again, where f of x was equal to x squared up here. And then I'm going to divide by h. So now we have to use those limit skills that we had from the last section to evaluate this limit. So I'm going to get the limit as h goes to 0 of, we can factor the top out. So I get 9 plus 6h plus h squared. All right, so how did I get that? can think about it off to the side here. I had a 3 plus h times a 3 plus h, and I had to FOIL those out. So the 3 times the 3 was 9 plus 3 times h and another 3 times h. And then at the end, I had the h squared. So I got 9 plus 6h plus h squared minus 3 squared here is 9. And then that's all over h. As we're doing these limits, remember we had that 0 on the bottom because h was going to 0. So that's why we couldn't evaluate it. We had a 0 over 0 type. So the goal is to cancel that h on the bottom. That's what I'm working towards. So let's see if we can fit everything in here. So I'll have the limit as h goes to 0. I notice the 9's cancel. 
And what I'm left with, both of those terms have an H in there. So I'm actually going to do two things at once, and I'll factor out the H of what's left. So I have a 6 plus H. And then I have that H on the bottom, which is great. That's what I wanted to do was cancel those H's. So I just have the limit as H goes to 0 of the quantity 6 plus H. So that's just 6. So that is my slope of the tangent line. So let's see what we found. We found the point on the tangent line up here. And now I found the slope on the tangent line. So I can just go ahead and use my point slope form to find the equation of the tangent line. A little short on space, so we'll just draw ourselves a little box here. So again, we have the point, 3, 9. The slope was 6. So that's why we really like point slope form, because we're often going to have this information when we're finding these tangent lines. So I just do y minus the y value equals slope times x minus the x value. And either we can leave it like that, or if you want to simplify it down, I get 6x minus 18 from distributing, and then I can add the 9 to the other side. Or y equals 6x minus 9. So that is the equation of this line we drew up here, this nice tangent line to f of x equals x squared at the point 3 comma 9. <clears throat> okay, let's go on and do one more example here. In this next example, they've just asked us to find the slope of the tangent line. So we don't need to do this extra step where we actually find the equation, but we do need to find the slope of the tangent line. So again, we have x equals 2, so that tells us that our a value in the equation is 2. And I'm just going to use this slope of the tangent line formula, which tells us that we have the limit as h goes to 0 of, let's make this a little smaller so it's easier to write, f of a plus h, so 2 plus h, minus f of a, so f of 2. So again, we're going to replace the a with the number they give us that I'm trying to find the tangent line at, over h. So that's the limit as h goes to 0 of f of 2 plus h means we have to take this 2 plus h and plug it into the x we see in our f of x. So I get 1 over 2 plus h minus 1 over 2 by plugging 2 into the function. And that whole thing is over h. So again, we have to use the skills that we learned in the previous chapter to actually go ahead and evaluate this limit. So I notice I have two separate fractions here. I've got the 1 over 2 plus h and the 1 over 2. So I probably want to find a common denominator in order to go ahead and evaluate this limit. Because if I plug in 0, I get 0 on the top and 0 on the bottom. Whenever we do these derivatives, so when you plug in h equals 0, we can look at what we're going to have. It's always going to be f of a minus f of a, so it's always 0 on the top and then it's always going to be 0 on the bottom. So we are going to have to use our limit techniques. We can't just use a direct substitution. All right, so let's go ahead and common denominator these. So <clears throat> I'm going to get the limit as h goes to 0. The common denominator can just be the product of those denominators. So the first one I'm going to multiply by 2 over 2, and the second one by 2 plus h over 2 plus h. So I get 2 over 2 plus h times 2 minus 2 plus h over 2 times 2 plus h. So you have the same denominator now. And then that whole thing is over h. So it's kind of ugly, but we can figure out what to do. Um, I'm just going to squeeze this up a little bit here. I'll cover everything. That seems good. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go ahead and combine those. I get the limit as h goes to 0. Up here on the top, I have this common denominator of 2 plus h times 2. And then I have 2 minus 2 
and then I'll distribute the minus to get a minus h. And then instead of dividing that by h, I can multiply by the reciprocal 1 over h. So let's just kind of figure out where everything went to. So I combined these two fractions here into a single fraction, since they had a common denominator. And then my divide by h here just became a multiply by 1 over h. Okay, so let's see what happens when we simplify this down. I'm going to have the limit as h goes to 0. 2 minus 2, those cancel. So I just get a negative h on the top, and then a 2 plus h times 2 on the bottom. And that's multiplied by 1 over h. So if I wanted to, because these fractions are multiplied, I can make it one big fraction. And I don't have to write this 1. Or you could leave it the way it is. But either way, we should be able to see that these h's now can cancel each other, which again, that was our goal, because that's what was making the denominator 0. So I get the limit as h goes to 0 of negative 1 over 2 plus h times 2, which if I plug in h equals 0 now, because I canceled the 0 on the bottom, I can plug it in, so I get negative 2 times 2, or negative 1 over 2 times 2, or negative 1 fourth. And so the slope of the tangent line to the function 1 over x at x equals 2 is 1, negative 1 fourth. So again, let's think about what that's going to look like in a graph. If we graph the function 1 over x, I'll graph it here in blue, it's going to look something like this. And so we're saying at x equals 2, right here, the slope of that tangent line, so here's my tangent line, the slope of this line is negative 1 quarter. So that's what we just determined. So if you need to take a second here, go back, look over all these operations. If you're unclear of a step, you can always rewind and rewatch that step. And I'm also happy to answer any questions you have on it. Just let me know. This idea of finding the slope of a tangent line is going to be really important for us. And because it's important, it gets its own name. Um, so when we talk about the derivative of a function at a point, that derivative of a function at a point is just the slope of the tangent line at that point. So if you ever see a question and it's asking you for the derivative of a function, that's the same as just asking you for the slope of the tangent line for that function. So that's a really good thing to remember. And we have a special notation for this. So if I have a function that I'm calling f and I want the derivative at x equals a, I just call that f prime of a. So f prime of a, the little prime here, means take the derivative. And so this is the derivative of the function f at x equals a, which by definition is just equal to the slope of the tangent line at that point. So this f prime of a is going to be equal to our limits that we had from before. So that's either going to be the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a, or we can use that limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. Either of these are going to be called the limit definition of derivative. And you can choose which one you want to use. So this is the limit definition of derivative, and that's going to be at a point x equals a. So maybe we'll say, yeah, the point x equals a here. So if you're ever asked to use the limit definition of derivative, you can use either two of these limit definitions. I like this bottom one better, because it's going to generalize to what we do in the next section. But if you want, you can use the top one as well. OK, so in this example below, we're asked to find f prime of 1. So we just have to remember that that means find the slope of the tangent line at x equals 1 which we do by using this limit definition. 
So let's go ahead and do that. Um, maybe for this example, I'll use that first definition just to kind of give you a feel for what that looks like. So I, again, have the inside of a one, so that tells me that A equals one in my definition. And so I'm gonna get the limit as X goes to one, because that's my A. In this definition, we just leave the X as X, so F of X minus F of one all over X minus one. So again, I'm gonna get zero on the bottom because I'm gonna get one minus one is zero. I get zero on the top. So we're gonna have to try to cancel that X minus one on the bottom here, where before we were trying to cancel the H on the bottom. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug everything in. So F of X, they just give me, that's three X squared plus two X minus F of one. I plug one into my function. So if I plug in one, I get three plus two, so that's just five. So let's write it as five here. Oh no, I forgot my limit. Let's go ahead and put that in there. I'll move this all over. I don't like that it doesn't get rid of the other stuff. That's fine, we can erase it. Doot, doot, doot. Okay, pop in that limit. Just like before when we were talking about limits, we always have to make sure we write our limit each time. All right, so now I see I have a quadratic on the top, and so I'm gonna wanna try to go ahead and factor that. This one's a slightly harder one to factor because it has that non-leading, uh, that coefficient, leading coefficient that's not one. But we can just try our hardest. So we get three x squared has to be a three x and an x. Five has to be a five and a one. If I put the five here, I end up getting 15, which is really big. 15 and one's not gonna give me two. So instead, let's go ahead and put the five over here, and then the one here. The other thing you can remember is that what's gonna happen is that I am gonna be able to cancel that x minus one on the bottom, so I definitely should have an x minus one in the top, just because these will work out nicely for us. So now, let's check, we've got a three x and a five x, and I want a positive two x, so I want a plus five, minus three to get that nice two x there. Perfect. So I factored it. I noticed my x minus ones can cancel. So I get the limit as x goes to one of three x plus five. Now that the one x minus one is canceled on the bottom, I can just do a direct substitution, plug that in and get eight. So that tells me that the derivative, right, this was my f prime of one, that f prime of one, the slope of that tangent line, at x equals one is equal to eight. Again, make sure you take some time, look back over this. Um, and if you want, one thing you could try is to set it up and do it using that other limit definition. So in this example, I ended up using this first definition here. That's the one that I used but you can also go back and try to use that second definition and you should get the same value. Let's look at one more example of finding the derivative at a point for a function, just so we can practice sort of all of the different types of limits we might have to do. So for this one, we're trying, we've got the function f of x equals square root of two x, and I'm asked to find f prime of two. So again, we can choose between either of those two limit definitions. I'm gonna go ahead and use the h one. So this is gonna become the limit as h goes to zero of f of, it's two inside, so my a is two. So I have f of two plus h minus f of two all over h. All right, so let's go ahead and find that limit here. So I'm gonna have the limit as h goes to zero. I take this two plus h, I plug it in to the x in my function. So I'm going to get square root of two times two plus h. Then we take this two, plug that into our function for x. So that just becomes minus square root of two times two all over that h on the bottom. 
Again, when I plug in zero, I'm gonna get zero over zero. The thing that makes the bottom zero is having this H. So my goal here is to be able to cancel the H on the bottom. All right, I'm gonna do one step of simplification here before we can get into our limit technique for this one. So I'm just gonna simplify this down. Two times the quantity two plus H, it's just become four plus two H. That's still under the square root. Two times two is four. So I'll put that under that square root as well, and then I've got my h in the denominator. All right, so I see here that I have a square root minus another square root. So whenever you have at least one square root, plus or minus some other function, in this case they both happen to be square roots, then when I'm doing a limit with that, I should multiply by the conjugate. So that's the technique we want to use here, multiply by this conjugate. So I'm gonna multiply same functions, four plus two h square rooted, four square rooted, but the conjugate is just gonna have a plus in the middle instead of a minus. So you just change whatever that middle sign is to the other sign. Okay, so I gotta to multiply top and bottom by that conjugate. So when I multiply the top out, I'm gonna get this four plus two h square rooted times four plus two h square rooted. So when I multiply those two together, the square root goes away. So I just get, again, keep my limit, four plus two h, because the square roots can cancel each other because they're two of the same things. And then I do four plus two h times root four, and then minus root four times the square root of four plus two h. So I can write both of those out. They are always gonna cancel when we're doing this. So if you don't wanna write them, you don't have to, but I kinda wanna show what I'm doing here. So we have a square root of four plus two h times a root four that gets added. And then my other one is gonna get subtracted. And so those two can cancel each other. And then at the end here, I'm gonna multiply this minus root four times this plus root four. And so a minus times a plus becomes a minus, and then root four times root four just becomes four. And that's all over this h that we had in the denominator, but then we also have that square root of four plus two h plus square root of four. All right, so then on the numerator, I notice I have a plus four here and then a minus four at the end, so those also can cancel. And so we'll do this in a couple steps. We have the limit as h goes to zero of just a two h on the top, and then an h times square root of four plus two h plus root four. If you notice, I didn't multiply the denominator out. I didn't distribute that h to everybody. And that's because my goal was to be able to cancel that H out. So I want to leave it factored out so I can be able to cancel it. So you do want to distribute out the, the numerator like we did, but you don't want to distribute out the denominator so we can keep that H by itself. Now I notice I have an H on the top and an H on the bottom, both multiplied by everything so I can cancel those, which is great. That was my overall goal here. So I have the limit as H goes to zero of two over root four plus two h plus root four. I've been writing this as a root four every time. Root four is equal to two, so you could easily write it as a two as well. It's up to you. And so now I can go ahead and plug in h equals zero. So I get two on the top and then root four, which again is two, sorry, root four plus two times zero. So still root four, which is two, plus another root four, so another two. So that's two over two plus two, or two over four, which is equal to one half. So overall here, we got that f prime of two equals one half. So the slope of the tangent line to the function square root of two x at x equals two, that slope is one half. All right, so we've done several examples of these, so let's actually talk about what they mean. So we wanna know what this derivative tells us. 
So let's start with an example for our cost function and see if we can kind of build up to what the derivative is actually telling us. So let's say I have C of X, and that's just the cost to produce X gallons of paint. Right, your function could be whatever you want. And so for this one, we're gonna have that cost in dollars to produce X gallons of paint. So now I haven't actually told you what the function is, and I'm not gonna ask for what the values of the function is at different spots. I just wanna know what different quantities tell us. So what does C prime of 20 tell us? So there's a 20 inside, so that tells me I'm making 20 gallons of paint. So this is just the cost to produce 20 gallons of paint. So cost to produce all 20 gallons of paint. Okay, and then if I have C of 20.1, well that's just going to be the cost to produce 20.1 gallons of paint. So just a little bit more gallons of paint. And so the next question asks us, what happens when we subtract those two quantities? Well, if I think about how much it costs to produce all of this 20.1 gallons, and then I subtract away the cost to produce that 20 gallons, so I can sort of draw this out, right? If I'm making 20 gallons of paint, I start off here, there's my kind of cost function, and I have to make one gallon and two gallons and three gallons and four gallons and five gallons all the way up to say 20 gallons. Similarly, if I'm doing my 20.1, I do the 20 all the way up and then I just go a tiny bit more and that's gonna be my 20.1 gallons. And so if I subtract those two quantities, what I'm left with is just this tiny little cost here and so that should just be the cost to produce just that extra 0 0.1 gallons after we produced 20. So it's sort of that cost of that next one-tenth of a gallon. But now if I take that cost of that next one-tenth of a gallon, and I divide it by 0.1, right? Really what we're doing here is we're sort of thinking about what these slopes of these secant lines mean. So remember, this is gonna give me the slope of the secant line. And because that 20.1 is really close to 20, it's gonna be approximately the same as the slope of the tangent line, which again, we said is equal to the derivative. So I'm gonna take this cost to produce that extra 0 0.1 gallons, and I'm gonna divide it by that 0 0.1 gallons. And so that, instead of saying, okay, this is how much it costs to make a tenth of a gallon, I divide that by a tenth, which again is multiplying by 10. So I'm taking the cost of a tenth of a gallon, I'm multiplying it by 10, so that's approximately the cost to produce the next gallon of paint. And so that's what these quantities, these secant lines, and really as we go towards the limit, these, ta these tangent lines are going to tell us. It's that cost to produce the next item. So the cost to produce the next gallon approximately, or if I'm producing, you know, a certain quantity it's the per of items it's the cost to produce that next item and that's how we should think about these derivatives so if we go on this page here we can see that when i'm asked for this derivative we can interpret that as that cost to interpret that or to develop or to produce that next item so this tells us after producing 20 items, the cost to produce the next item, so we usually like to think about it in quantities of one, is about, because it's just an approximation, C prime of 20. 
dollars. So that's called a marginal cost, the cost to produce that next item. So that's how we should sort of think about this here. The derivative tells us the cost of the next item. So that's like the 21st item. <clears throat> okay, so let's do the same sort of thing with one more example. So we can think of it in terms of distance. So let D of T be the distance of a car after T seconds from the start of a race, and we want to find d of 20 and d prime of 20. So d of 20 is, sorry, not 20, 60. d of 60 is the distance after 60 seconds. So it's the distance traveled by the car after 60 seconds. Okay, now let's think about this d prime of 60. So when we're interpreting these derivatives, it's actually helpful to think about them as a se approximate secant line. So I'm going to think of this as approximately equal to, I'm just going to say d of the next one, 61 minus d of 60 over that 1. By having it over 1, it's sort of easier to think about. So what does this mean? So this d of 61 is the distance traveled after 61 seconds minus the distance traveled after 60 seconds over that one second, okay? So maybe we have like a nice chart over here that's gonna tell us how far the car has traveled. So at time zero, maybe it's gone zero. At 10, it's gone like 50 meters. Let's say at 60, it's gone 1,500 meters. And then at 61, it's gone 1,503 meters. So if I subtract these, the distance traveled at 61 seconds minus the distance traveled at 60 seconds, it's just giving us the distance traveled in that 60th or 61st second. So that's the distance traveled in that one second divided by that one second. So it's going to give us the distance traveled in meters in one second divided by one second. So if we think about this, okay, I have how far I've gone in one second divided by that second. Well, that's just going to give me my velocity or my speed. So whenever we have a distance function and we're taking its derivative, that gives me that velocity or speed after that amount of time. So overall, I'm just going to get the velocity or speed. We can think of those in this context. Those are going to be the same for us. Usually we'd have speed as a positive quantity and velocity is going to have some sort of uh, direction in there. So we can think of the velocity or speed after the car has gone 60 seconds, which again, we can think about in terms of one minute if we wanted to. And that's gonna be in units, meters per second. So in general, right, these distance functions, their derivatives are gonna give us this velocity, where these cost functions, they're gonna give us that marginal cost. And that's gonna be the same for profit or revenue. It's gonna be the cost or profit or revenue of that next item. So those are our uh, different interpretations that we get. That's all for this section. In the next section, we'll talk about the derivative as a function. So instead of just finding the derivative at a single point, we'll sort of find a function that represents the derivative of each of these points.